And uh, let's get back in this message. We've been in for several weeks. Um, it's God's will that everyone be saved. That's not only his will, that's his desire. His desire, the scripture says it flips it, but the scripture says it's not God's will that any should perish. But that all, so the opposite of that is it's God's will for everyone to be saved. And if you don't believe that's God's will and God's desire, you need to travel with me on the hill far away. There stood an old rugged cross that God proved how much he desires everyone to be saved. But the problem is, and God knew it from the beginning, most people are not going to take advantage of this great salvation. And he said that many are going the wrong way. When you go the wrong way, you've got to turn around. You, you, if you go the wrong way, most of the time it's because you've got bad directions. Or you're following the wrong crowd. And so scripture gives us revelation. Gives us direction. I was thinking this morning. I said you know. I just sense there's such an urgency in my spirit. That this great salvation that is offered today so freely. That whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord today shall be saved. But there's such an urgency. And there's such a. A quickening in my spirit. That that opportunity is fleeing. You don't have to give your life to a theological study of biblical prophecy. And just a casual reading and understanding and believing the word of God is true. Just a casual reading of scripture. Then you know that Jesus is coming soon. That the end is here. And when he comes, he's going to come for his church. And that opportunity will be closed to most. And so with that pending, homegoing, hallelujah, that's good news for me. It's bad news for most people, but it's good news for me. Can you wave your hand today and say, when Jesus is coming today, that's good news for me. So what you're saying is, I know whom I have to live. And I'm ready. First load out, I'm heading up with him. I'm as soon as the trumpet sounds, I'm out of here. You can have all my stuff if you want it. You, you know, my car keys are in my little thing over here in my office. So if you want to get my new car and ride around in it, it's yours. All right? Now, not until I leave, though. But if I'm gone and the trumpet sounds and you left behind, you have all my stuff. It's all yours. All right? Because I don't need it anymore. But there's an urgency in, in the end times. And, and, and with that backdrop, I, I just feel like that so many people are, are going to hell. Now, I, I can't soft soap, but I can't say it any other way. I know that's, that's shocking to say in this societal woke generation. But most people are going down to go to hell. Most people are going to be left behind. They're going to miss the coming of the Lord. Most people are going to go through tribulation and then be cast into the lake of fire. Most people are. And that's, that should burden us. That should cause us, because every one of us has people we love and, and family members who are not right with the Lord. And that and we should be more, more burdened and more passionate, in our, at least in our prayer life, as we intercede for them. But with that in mind, thinking about that day and that revelation, as I've said so many times in this series, that surprise, surprise moment that Jesus talks about in Matthew, on that day many will say, but Lord, Lord, we went to River of Life Worship Center. Brother Bobby was my pastor. He, he baptized me. I helped serve in the kitchen. I worshipped. I did everything. I was, I, but Lord, Lord, but I never knew you. Now that's sobering. Not that the, most people are going to die and go to hell, but, but, but here in, in America, and especially in the Bible Belt, where we live, what's shocking is they're going to go surprise, surprise. They're going to leave this world thinking 
They're going to heaven. Isn't that the way it is when you read the old bits and you go to funerals? Everybody goes to heaven. They live like hell. They never go to church. They never have anything to do with Jesus. But they got their angel wings when they die. Folks, it don't work that way. The, 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 the little train method does not work with your salvation. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. No, you fail and you go to hell. And so we... And with that in mind, I don't want anybody to go to hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He wants everybody to be saved. And, and I'm, I'm, like the, I'm like the Father in that respect. I want everybody to be saved. And not only be saved, but be sure. Yes. Not have a hope so, but a no so faith. And so that's what this passage that we're, we're, we're going off of in, in this directive that we have in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says that every one of us should examine ourselves, not examine each other. Examine ourselves and see if we're saved, if we're the real thing. He, he didn't say, say examine. He said examine it. To the point of proving it. E examine and say, well, I, you know, I, th I think, you know. No, no, he said, examine and prove. Prove it. What, what does that mean? Test it. Put it to the test. If I'm really saved, my faith and my eternal salvation that's grounded in this faith, it, it should be able to pass the test. It should pass muster. Now, 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 most of the time when we examine our faith, we use the wrong, the, the wrong uh, test, the wrong things to test our salvation. How do we test our salvation most of the time? Well, how we test it most things. How do we feel? Well, I feel like, well, you, think, you know, I think I am. I feel like I'm saved. Let me tell you what, your feelings are not, a, they're not the proving kind of test. Because some days I'm just, a, I'm, I am saved and sure I'm saved, but some days I wake up and I'm, I'm in a bad mood. Or I don't feel it. And, 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 and so I can't go on my feelings. How, how, how's another way that, that, that most of us good church folk test our salvation? By, by examining ourselves, by, by, by uh, comparing ourselves with others. Well, I'm better than they are. I go to church more than he does. I don't curse. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't abuse the puppies. So I must be. And there, that, that leads us to another failed test, and that is good and bad. You see, that would be a good, good test and a good measure <laughs> if we could, through our good works, earn our way to heaven. If God led us into heaven based on who's good and who's bad, then, then, then hey, I have a fighting chance. I have a puncher's chance at that. Because I'm a pretty good dude. Comparatively speaking. Again, comparatively speaking, because I am my, hey, I am not a good dude compared to Jesus. He's the standard. God is the standard. If you're going to go to heaven based on your goodness, then you have to be as good as God. You have to be 100% holy. No, thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy. No, none of us will ever make it to heaven by being good or doing good works. Because our goodness is filthy before a holy God. My best day is ugly and nasty and dirty and stinky and vile and vulgar before holy God. So to test it, that brings up the question, and I could go on and on and on about the, the things that we use, the the, the measures that we Luke use to, for the test. But let me just tell you the, the way. How do you examine? Because I, I hope that you've got enough sense to know you need to be saved. You need it. You're not going to heaven unless you, unless you find out what God requires. It's His heaven. 
and that you are uh, completely transformed and become a new creation. How, see, these things are written, 1 John 5, these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. So there it is. What is the best test? Well, there's two ways. There are two tests that God has provided that every one of us can prove our salvation with. Two things, two ways. First of all, is again, these things are written that you may know. How do I know I'm saved? He told me what, he, he put the requirements in black and white and red. God's salvation is not a mystery, it's not a secret, it's recorded in this book. And if I stand before God, he wants to say, you know, when you get to the pearly gate and Peter asks you, why are you, using, hey, Peter is not in charge of the gate. Jesus said, I'm the gate. He's not the gatekeeper, he's the gate. And when I get before Jesus and, 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 and it's either in or out, and he says, why should I let you in? He's not going to do that because he already knows. I got a new name written down in glory. Amen. He knows my name. He knows me. He knows me as his sheep. He's my shepherd. And so when I get there, but if there is conversation and he was to ask me, why should I let you in? I'm going to say your word. You said. Not I feel or I think or I preached or I went to the mission field or. Oh, no. You said. You said. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You said if we believe that God raised him from the dead, he's a resurrected Savior. And we confess with our mouth, then thou shalt be saved. And you cannot lie, Jesus. Man, listen, listen if you want to know you're saved, you've got to test it by the word. Put it to the Bible test. I said that yesterday, Brother Eugene's service. I said, you know, the Bible tells us that couple of ways we'll know whether people are saved or not. One, out of the mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we listen to what they say and, and, uh, and uh, you'll know them by their fruit. Well, in modern times, I, I said this, I said that, that that's changed. Out of the abundance of the heart, we post it on Facebook. You know them by their Facebook post. Man, I, 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 again, I quit going on Facebook because of, I, I realize that a lot of times I, I'm hanging out with people on Sunday who claim to be Christian, but then when I read their post and, and see what's in their heart, there's a discrepancy. And that's depressing. How the, hey, it's the Word of God. I know I'm saved because I've tested it. I've worked it out. With fear and trembling. But what's the other measure? What's the other standard? What's the other rule to test it? Well, it's a he. And his name's Holy Ghost. He's the revealer. He, when he comes, he will convict. He will draw to Jesus. And so listen, I stand on the word of God and I have the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. So listen, if I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm not, and I don't, I'm not feeling it, though I've, I've been at this a long time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hit my knees. And I'm going to cry out to the Lord, Lord, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. But I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm not going to hell. I want to make sure, I want to know, and I'll go back to the book. I'll cry out and pray to the Holy Ghost revealing me. See, here's how I, how I know Holy Ghost conviction. This is how I, this is how I can hear from God. It's through His Holy Spirit. It's an internal, it's an internal work. It, it's a peace that passes all understanding. Now here's where it gets sticky. Here's where it gets confusing. And I've even counseled with some of you since I've started this series. Because you've been a little troubled, you've been a little anxious, you've been a little uncertain because you're smart. <laughs> you, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not a risk taker. You're not a gambler. You talk about gamblers. You, you, you go through life without knowing you're saved. You, you, you don't, you, you, hey, there ain't nobody in Vegas. 
got more gambling courage than you do. Because what did it profit if you gained the whole world lost your soul? But, but, but this is where it gets sticky, and I'm going to kind of try to get back into this text. It's what really kind of gets confusing, because once the Holy Spirit convicts you, then you've got to discern what he's saying. Because Holy Spirit conviction feels the same. Whether you're lost, whether you're saved, if, you're, if, if, if God, listen, if you're lost, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of your sin and draw you to the Savior. If you're saved and you have unconfessed sin in your life, Holy Ghost, same Holy Ghost, is going to convict you of your sin. And the conviction feels exactly the same. It's going to trouble you. It's, going, it's, it's, it's the Holy Ghost saying, uh-uh, no, 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 no. It takes away your peace. You see, that's the beauty of being saved. When you got saved, God's peace filled your soul. And you know it. You experience it. And you want it. And when you lose it, it's because the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Now, I've, I've shared my testimony. When I got called into the ministry, I went through uh, several days of just straight-up confusion because the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I thought, first of all, well, maybe I'm not saved, so I got saved. I Pray the sinner's prayer. I dealt with that. And the conviction didn't go away. The peace didn't come back. Then I went down there and confessed every sin that I knew. I confessed my older brother's sin because I knew his sin. <laughs> and, and, and everybody in proximity to me, I was confessing their sin. I even confess America's sins. I confess everybody's sin. I repented and still never got my peace back. Come to find out God was calling me to full-time Christian ministry. So, 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 so you got, you got... Don't just give it a wink and a blink. Dig deep. But I know I'm saved, and you can know you're saved by the Word of God, not by a church membership. See, those are, so many of those who are going to be surprised, surprised, surprised on Judgment Day are going to think they're going to heaven because they're a member of a church or a group. And they just relegated their soul, the power of their will of their soul to some preacher, priest, guru. No, no, it's your responsibility. In other words, when you get to heaven and you, you're lost and you're going to have, you can't raise your hand and say, well, it's Pastor so-and-so's fault. He didn't tell me. No, it's your responsibility to work out your salvation. It's your soul. Well, you're not just going to take all your money and pile it up and then you just dump it on the bankers. No, you're going to know to the penny how much you put in that bank. But yet you're so cash. And so with that backdrop, and I don't know chasing rabbits. And when I get tired, I chase rabbits. And I'm exhausted. <laughs> Emotionally just drained. So I don't think I'm going to go very far today. But, but we, we, we're looking at this examination. And we're doing a couple of case studies because... There are two men that jumped at me, one who was artificial and one who was authentic in being born again, being saved. One who was religious and everybody, everybody that knew him were 100% convinced that he was real, that he was saved. Because after all, he was a disciple. After all, he did ministry. After all, he was involved in God's miracle work and power. After all, he was in spiritual warfare. He was casting out devils. He had all the outward acumens of, of being saved, but he was a devil. His name is Judas Iscariot. We went through him for several weeks. And then we turned from the artificial, the fake, to the real deal. One who encountered Jesus and was gloriously born again. The story opens in Acts chapter 9. Saul of Tarsus, he's on a Damascus road. He's anti-Christ. He is completely against it. He's doing everything in his power with great passion and fire to, to, to stomp out the name of Jesus. We've already put him on a cross and he, he's done away with. Now we've got to get rid of the remnant of those who hang around and say they're followers of Christ. So it's my calling. It's my duty to God. It's my religious zealot to just step out and eliminate Christ. And uh oh the one he thought was dead was fully alive. 
And on the Damascus Road, he ran head in, not to the suffering, dying lamb, but to the resurrected Savior. And what a difference. You see, those Pharisees and Sadducees, their last glimpse of Jesus was beaten, bloody, bloody pup on a cross. Again, I, and this is a good question. Maybe you haven't asked it. Yes, but it's a good question to ask, but I don't have the answer. I can, I, I can speculate. I can speculate as good as anybody. I'm a good speculator. Can't say it, but I'm good at it. Here's a good question. Because Paul and Jesus were basically the same age. Paul was a Pharisee. This whole encounter of, of, of chasing Jesus down and crucifying him was driven by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So where was Paul? Did Paul was Paul there? Did Paul ever meet Jesus before the crucifixion? Was, did Paul go to the crucifixion? Uh, what, what, where was Paul in all? Speculate all I want. But I guarantee you, he had heard all the stories, whether he met him or not. He had met, hey, I, I know he's heard the gospel. And we'll see that, that we know he heard the gospel because in Acts chapter 7, he was standing there when Stephen was stoned. He gave the order to murder Stephen. And what did Stephen do? He went out preaching the gospel. He went out praying for Paul. He did. I, I, again, I'm speculating, but I kind of got a feeling with this big event, the Pharisees were working together. Paul was probably at the crucifixion, or Saul. I, I can't, don't pin me down on that. That's one of those questions I'm going to ask when I get to heaven. But this was a major event for the religious leaders of that day. They had finally got him and nailed him to a cross. Again, I don't know 100% sure, but I got a feeling he was there. And so can you imagine he's thinking that this dead Jew who was a fraud and a blasphemer and we, we put him out of his misery and we got rid of him and we killed him. I watched him and I heard about his death. Now I just got to stomp out this last bunch of crazy people that he had stirred up in his cult. And here on this Damascus road, he meets him. Listen, let me tell you something. You deny him. You can fight against him. You can do everything you can to eliminate Jesus. But you can't get rid of him. And this Jesus, he saw wasn't a lamb. He was a lion. He was, well, blinded by the light. Let's read about this. And we started looking at this last week. There's so much in this passage. So it's going to take me probably the rest of my life to get through this message. It's long to get drawn out. There's just so much good stuff in this. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings. This is chapter 9, verse number 1, Acts. And yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if any found it this way, whether they were men or women, in this modern age that we live in, he'd be in trouble right there for using pronouns. <laughs> you know, in the modern wolf Bible, it's whether they were men, women, or undecided, or unsure, or just confused. He might bring them bound into Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, and shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Notice, why are you persecuting me? Not my church. But me. Because why? If you touch this church, you're touching him. If you come against this pastor, you come against river of life, you come against God's people, you're fighting Jesus. As long as I'm, I'm in relationship with him, we're inseparable. So, so what we're looking at, since Saul's dramatic conversion, he, he got born again, he got saved. So from this, we're able to test and examine and to bring out some points. Now, 
two ways that we can apply this today. If you're not sure that you're saved, then you can apply it personally for your, your salvation. These things that happened in Saul's life, this, this, this gospel encounter from Jesus Christ in Saul's life, everyone who will be born again, who has been born again, they follow these basic principles. These things will be evident. The same thing that Jesus did, the same way he brought Saul into the body of Christ, he brought me into the body of Christ. He's brought every believer. So these things, if you're truly saved, if you're genuinely saved, these things that Jesus had and used in this encounter with Saul, this evangelistic encounter, this mission encounter, they were present in your life. So it's applied personally. So as we listen to these things, then let's just put our testimony up against it. Did this happen to me? The things that happened to Saul, have, have they happened in my life? And if they didn't happen in your life, chances are you're on that wrong road. You're not truly born again. You might be religious. You might be good. You might be at church. You might have water baptisms in your, in your history. But if these things are not evident and have not happened in your life and are part of your personal salvation testimony, you need to go back to the examination table and examine it. Now, that, that's a personal application. But see, not only are we to be saved, and again, these things will be in our salvation testimony, but we are called to lead others. And so as we go into this world to rescue the perishing and share our faith with others. We follow the example of Christ. How did he do it? What were the things that we that he used that we must use? You see, it applies both ways. So in other words, if you're saved and you're sure of it like I am, don't go to sleep on me. Because you, you, you need to be, see, most people are in the far country going on the wrong road that leads to destruction. And it's our job to stop them, to turn them around. So what did we know? We noted that the first thing that I saw in this that will be evident, it was evident in my salvation experience, it was evident in yours, it will be evident in everyone. First, it starts with a confrontation. Confrontation, that's what we talked about last week. You see, Jesus, if someone's wrong, they're thinking wrong because his, his, he was thinking wrong. He was thinking that he was right and Jesus was wrong. He was thinking that he was doing God a favor by eliminating this blasphemer. So he, he was deranged in his thinking. He was thinking bad. So he was on the wrong road, but he was confident and sure and full of passion and anger. So he, if he was going to get off that road or turn around and get on the right road, the narrow road, there had to be someone to step in his path. Someone had to get, someone had to step in front of him. Now I'm telling you what, why did Jesus do this? Probably because he couldn't get anybody in church to do it. Because Saul was, man, the church was scared of Saul. And you can go read some of the writings that Paul did. He, Paul knew it. He was proud of it. He was, a, he was a terrorist. He, 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 he liked to use threats. And so the church was scared of him. As a matter of fact, once he got, when, when he got Jesus blinded him, and he sent him to Ananias, and then the, the, the Ananias, he got born again, he taught him, and then when, when he went to go to the church, to start going to church, nobody wanted him to come to the church. They, it, no way, no way. This is, he's, he, he's a spy. Listen, now, Jesus probably walked by the church and said, I need somebody to go share the gospel and get on the road and, and confront Saul of Tarkin. Well, I put a sign-up sheet in the back. I need somebody to volunteer. No one wrote their name now. No, someone like this, somebody as important as Saul's future was, no, Jesus, I'm making light of it, but Jesus could handle it. Jesus was not scared of Paul. He's not scared of anybody. And in our text, he's going the wrong way. He's thinking the wrong way. His mind's made up. He's passionate. And he's a zealot. Oh, I love that word. Suddenly, it's in the text. There was a light. God kicked him off his high horse. Suddenly, boy, that's. 
that's good news today. Because some of you, you're married to or you have family members or friends who are so zealously against the church and so zealously against the word of God and so zealous against the, the name of Jesus and, they, and they're just full of hell and full of demons and, and you're thinking, boy, there's no hope for them. Hey, hey can, oh my God can work in a suddenly. Some of you know what I'm talking about because that was you. And everybody giving up on you. Yeah, ain't nothing but an old drug addict. And nothing good ever could come out of them. And then all of a sudden, somebody brought the gospel to you. Someone got in your way. And suddenly, the light shined. And we looked last week at the how. See, you see, no one will ever be saved without confrontation. And we don't, we don't evangelize, but we don't like confrontation. But when that family member's got the wrong mindset and they're traveling the wrong road, it is our job, it is our calling, it is our responsibility, and it's our accountability before God to step in front of them and say, Stop! Stop! We've got to confront them. That's evangelism. That's our job. Now, here was the question we examined last week. How do we confront without being confrontational? How do we get in front of someone who does not like us, who hates us, who wants to kill us, and not have a fight? That's the challenge. Because I'm not Jesus. Jesus stepped in, and, and I gave you those three hows. How? Well, here's how Jesus did it. First thing you got to understand, he's motivated by love. See, don't ever jump in front of somebody if you don't love that person. Don't jump in front of them if it's your desire in your heart to kill them, to stop them, to, to silence them. See, that's the problem reason we're not winning a lot of people to, this world, to the Lord Jesus and a lot of people in this world because we don't like them. No, we hate them. There's so much hatred and animosity towards this lost world. And it's a hard, hey, listen, it is hard not to. When they're constantly blaspheming my God and doing everything they can to silence me and stop me. And, and, and they're, doing, they're raping and pilfering to the little minds of our children. And it's hard for me not to get a righteous anger and say, blast them to hell. Let me get in front of them. I'll confront them. Give me a microphone. And so if we jump in front of this lost world with the gospel of peace, looking for a fight, we're wrong. And we're going to make them 12 times more hellion. Instead of bringing them to faith in Christ, we're going to push them farther into hell. Listen, Jesus had come to seek and to save that which is lost. God so loved the world. He confronted this lost world. And I tell you, we as his messengers, his mouthpiece, his hands and his feet, when we step in front of somebody, no one's going to be saved until we step in front of them and confront them. We must be doing it in love. We, might, we don't have to like who they are or where they're at, but we've got to love them and we've got to want to see them born again and saved. Listen, don't go to the mission field. Don't go in front of somebody with the gospel if you hate them. No, you go when you love them. Jesus loved him. And then Jesus, I did, I'm just regrouping from that. Not only did he love him, he, he, he challenged his motive. Why? Hey, that's what Jesus, why? Why? What? Man, that's a good question. Why did they hate Jesus? What was his crime? What did he do? Surely he was a murderer. Surely he was a thief. Surely he kicked puppy dogs. Surely he was a hate monger. Check the history book. You don't have to go to the Bible. Check the history book. Even the, even the judge says, I find no fault in this man. He was a man who was perfect. Perfect in love. Perfect in action. Perfect in deed. And so he's just challenging, okay, Paul, you hate me. You hate my church. You hate everything about me. Why? What did I do? Have you ever had anybody just don't like you? You don't know why? What have I done? I 
I've had people leave the church and just go off and just hate the church and hate me, and I'm just, well, what did I do? And then at that point, lies can break out. But truth and reality, what did I do? Because if I did something bad to cause you to not like me, let's work it out. Let me apologize. Show me. Because I don't want to, I don't, I like the body of Christ. We've got to work together. We've got to stay together. Whether you're a member of River Life or not, we're still family. And listen, if you hate me, how are you going to say you love God? If you hate the church and you hate River Life and you hate me, something's wrong. Hey, I, I, I may have messed up and caused that hate in your life. But if you hold on to it, God can't forgive you. And it's just going gonna, gonna to perpetually get worse. And so you better, no, God wants us to be healed. If you got all with your brother, go to it. Don't go to your neighbor. Don't go to Facebook. Go to them. And then and, and, and sometimes you might need to take a witness because the devil will lie. I'm chasing rabbits. But I'm telling you, this is important. Because if you've got hate and animosity in your heart sitting here this morning, you're stopping a move of God. We have to examine not only our salvation, we need to examine our heart. If you have unforgiveness, the Bible is very explicit and very clear. If you have hate for your brother, how can you, and you won't forgive him, how can you expect God to forgive you? You can't. And so he confronts him. Why? That's a good question. Paul never thought he just got caught up in a movement. He just got caught up in the peer pressure. And then he, then he challenged him. He said, he, he challenged him as a hypocrite. That was the third thing I showed you last week. Because the text says he's a slaughterer. Slaughter is murder on a big scale. Murder is, I, I murder somebody, you kill them. But if you slaughter, that's, that's a gallon gun move. <laughs> that indicates there were more than one. He's a Pharisee and the keeper of the law. The sixth commandment's clear. Thou shalt not kill. Jesus says, you've got some problems with your, with your theology. You hypocrite. So he, and listen, Paul was an educator. He was brilliant. He began to question him, question his motive, and question his his. his what are you doing this? You're wrong, Paul. There's a, two wrongs will never make a right. So you hate me, but why are you killing people? God ain't in that. So how do you confront? Well, that's how we confront, the way Jesus confronted him. Now here's the second thing, and I'll move into another dimension of this. Uh, confrontation. We saw how. And I've already kind of preached this, so the good news is I don't have to re-preach it. I got my message a little out of balance today. I went to the end and preached it at the beginning. When you get tired, you can't stay with your notes. But I'm going to be a little more succinct with this. Make sure we can package it where you can leave here and understand this. Because if you're going to be saved, not only will you, you're going to be confronted, there's going to be confrontation. And if you're going to lead somebody else, you're going to have to confront them. And you've got to do it the right way, with the right spirit. In love. That's how. But what? Okay, I jump in front of them. I say, stop in the name of Jesus. Now what? Because you see, you've got, you're going to have to, you're going to have to communicate. You can't just stand there and say, no. We call it the go tell. Our job is is to preach the gospel. So, so, so we're to confront in the right manner, like Jesus did, with love. But what do we say once we stop? Once you stop and you get in front of somebody who's lost on the wrong road, angry, mad. Well, probably if you, if you really want to do it, just grab them a hug because I just love you. Because love never fails. Because they, they, they want to fight. They want to slug you. It's hard for folk to hate you and slug you when you, you love them. 
The Bible says he the coals of fire on their head. Just, just say, golly, I love you. Make sure they understand that. But then you got still got to tell them. You got to, you got to tell them so. So, so what, 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 what were the things that Jesus confronted Saul with? Well, we all, we see them right in the text. First of all, the light. Did you see it? And suddenly, there was a light, blinding light. Now, who is that? Not what is that? Who is that? Because in verse 5, Paul wanted to know about that light. It wasn't a mystery. The one who stopped him, who, he was the light. Let me tell you what that light was. That was Jesus. Because in verse 5, he says, when Paul asked him who, Saul asked him who he said, I am. I am. Uh oh. I am. Wait, wait, hey, remember Paul? Remember Moses? Go to go to Egypt. Tell Pharaoh, let my be. Who am I going? Who, who, who? When they go ask me who sent me, tell him I am sent you. When Paul wanted to know who he was, Jesus, the Son of God, who was God incarnate, said, "I am. I am Jesus, Yeshua." You said I was a fraud. You said I was a blasphemer. You were convinced that you had to stop me. You nailed me to a cross. But I am the resurrected God. What a revelation. John 8 says this. Listen, everyone who ever got saved, who ever will get saved, will have an encounter with the risen Savior. You're going to have the light shining on you. Larry Gatlin, he would always been one of my favorite singer-songwriters. I've, I've gone to Branson three or four times to hear the Gatlin brothers. I, I grew up loving that family harmony. One of the biggest treats of my life, I was in Branson on motorcycle. Me and a couple of guys that rode our motorcycle up there. And, and we were there when the Gatlins were singing. It was a Christmas program. And they invited folk up on the stage to sing with them. We were on the front row. I raised my hand. I got to sing with Larry Gatlin. That's my one claim to fame. <laughs> I sang on the stage at Branson with Larry Gatlin. I think all I did was follow la la la. But hey, I got to sing with him. He's wrote a gospel song. Brother Dwayne used to sing. It's one of my favorite. I ask him constantly to sing because I love that song. He said, there's a light at the end of the darkness. He said, I was looking up from the bottom when it finally shined on me. Paul had an encounter with the light. And Jesus said, I, listen to this. John 8, just what Jesus said. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He that follow me shall never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Light gives us a couple of things that we must have. It gives us perception. See, and I, and I preached on this in the past. When someone's blind, you can be blind and have perfect eyesight. You can have 20-20 vision or even better than that and still be blind. What is blindness? It's the absence of light. I don't care how good your sight is. We turn off all the lights and block up all the windows and it get pitch black in here. We're all blind. You can't see a thing. Have you ever been in a dark place like that? You, can, you lose your orientation real fast. So if you're going to have vision, if you're going to have perception, if you're going to have understanding, you have to have light. And this is true about our Christian faith. If someone is going to get the understanding and perception and the knowledge of who Jesus is, it starts with the, the, the revelation of light. Someone has to turn the light on. And not only does light give us perception, understanding, light gives us direction. The Word is a lamp, a light unto my path. The light it gives us, it shows us the way. Jesus is the light. He's my light. So listen to me. First thing must happen. If you're going to have a genuine salvation experience, 
You have to be confronted with Jesus Christ. Jesus said this. He said, our job is pretty easy, really. It's simple. Evangelism is not complicated. Jesus simplified. He says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. He said, I'll do the draw, and you just do the lifting. That's why we have church. That's, what we, that's our goal every Sunday when we get here together, that, that Jesus Christ be lifted up. Let him shine. Let him show. Through our songs, through our preaching, everything. Jesus is the center of attention. If I take any of the glory or any of the attention, if you look at me and you miss him, you have failed. You have, you, you, you're going to go away disappointed and never changed. So I go to lift him up. Yesterday, we had the impossible task, really, of coming to grips with Brother Eugene's home going. And uh, I'll never get over that. What was his favorite scripture? He had a tattooed on him. Let me read it for you. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But at that name of Jesus. Listen, you cannot be saved in Buddha name, in Muhammad name, in Biden name. Palestinian can't even say. <laughs> Welfare can't say. Doctors can't say. Mom and daddy can't say. Pastor Bobby can't say. If you're going to be saved and if you're going to get into heaven when you die, you go through Jesus and he alone. I am the way, he said, the truth and the life. So the first thing must happen. There has to be a confrontation with Jesus. Saul had a face-to-face -to -face head on meeting with Jesus Christ. Same thing I did when I got saved. But not only, okay, we jump in front of him, we tell him that, we, we, we lift up Jesus in front of him, we might grab our cross, come out from among them, at that point, then we've got to move the discussion. Well, who is Jesus? We've got to describe him. We've got to explain him. And so what, what, what happened in, Saul, in Saul's life on the road to Damascus when Jesus confronted him? He confronted him with himself, the light. But he also confronted him with the word. He said, well, let's read it right out of the text. Well, where's it at? Verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice. Now, what voice was he hearing? The Word. Jesus was the living Word. He, he, he heard the gospel. He heard Jesus speak the Word of God. All who are saved have heard the Word of God. There's no way that anybody could ever be saved unless they hear the Word of God. It's important that we share our personal testimony, but your testimony must include the Word of God. Let me just read it from, our text, from another text. Romans, Paul, and the Saul who became Paul, he wrote about this. His experience with the Word. Romans 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who have not heard? And how shall they hear without somebody confronting them, lifting up Jesus and preaching the word? The word. They must encounter the word. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. Hearing by This I, I, oh, we, I thought I was going to keep it short today, and I, and I, and matter of fact, I, I, I stopped. I, I, I had planned to go several points, 
And then I got it this morning. I said, I'm tired, so I'm going to cut it off. And so I, I brought the invitation into the cutting off spot that I planned this morning. I ain't even close to that. <laughs> so this is a dilemma. I don't know how to close this. <laughs> I didn't get to my, 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 my fast closing spot. Let's just, let's just stop right here, but let me just reiterate. You're saved or you're lost today. You're on your way to heaven, or if you die today, depart from me, I never knew you. You're not a little saved or a little lost or almost saved or almost lost. No, you're either one or the other. You either accepted Christ, the light of the world, when you were confronted, maybe this is the first time you've ever been confronted with this. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you how I'll close this up. The Word of God. Let me just, because see, maybe you're watching my television or you're sitting here today and you say, okay, I, I, tell me, preacher, how do, how, how, what, you say I gotta have the Word. What does the Word say about how to be saved? I'm glad you asked. Every believer ought to be able to drop the, it's called the Roman road. Can I close with the Roman road? Because if you're going to get saved, you got to have the word. you got to have theology. And this is God. Paul, was the Saul of Tarsus, he wrote, he wrote, well, the Holy Ghost wrote it, but he penned it. The Roman road came after the Damascus road. What is the Roman road? Hey, let me give it to you real succinctly. It starts with bad news. Here's the bad news. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. That's bad news today. That's, folk don't want it. That's confrontation that'll get you in a fist fight in most places. People don't, people don't want you to tell them that they're sinners. We've cleaned it up. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. When I grew up, the words were different than they are now. When he devoted such sacred blood. When it was originally penned, you know what the writer said? For such a worm as I. I grew up singing about a worm. A grub. When he devoted his sacred head for such a worm as I. In about the 70s, that was offensive. Nobody wanted to be called a wiggle worm. A grub worm. So we got to clean that up. Let's make it, let's just go to the King James. Let's clean that up. And so we change it. When he devoted such sacred head for a sinner such as I. I grew up in my teen years singing that I was a sinner. And then they came out with the latest edition of the Baptist hymnal and they cleaned it up even more. Would he devote such sacred blood for someone such as I? We've gone from a word to someone. I'm going to tell you what, when you're a someone, that means you're special. When you're a word, that means you're not so special. I tell you, you're not going to get saved until you understand you don't deserve to be saved. You must come to grips with the fact, I have sinned. I am a sinner by nature and by choice. But the grace of God, there's no hope. Bad news that I've sinned, and that's the bad news we've all sinned. And when I got saved as a seven-year-old, I was confronted with the fact, even as a little boy, that I was a sinner. Broke me down. But that wasn't the, the baddest part of the bad news. The baddest part of the bad news is that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says, And the wages of sin is death. Because you're a sinner, you're lost. You're going to hell. You're going to die and bust hell wide open. And thank God he didn't just, just give us bad news. Here comes the good news. Romans 6, 23. Let's keep going down the Roman road. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, the light, our Lord. Salvation is a free gift, freely offered to everyone. You can't earn this gift. You have to reach out in faith and receive it. Romans 5, 8. But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9. Now, you're a sinner. And the result of that, you're lost. You're going to hell. But God stepped in. He stepped in in front of a lost world on a highway to hell without hope. 
And he said, I'll pay them back. I'll pay the price. I'll take their sin and bear it on me. Put me on their cross. And Jesus died in my stead. He died in my place. He was crucified, not for his sin, but for my sin. And now, he says, now Bobby, I've done it. Your debt's paid, but you have to receive it. You have to, by an act of your faith, say, okay, Jesus, I receive your gift of salvation. Thank you for dying for me. And if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what I did. Confronted the Calvary Baptist Church, a little seven-year-old boy. The Holy Ghost convicted me. I was lost. The light shined on me. Revelation, perception, and understanding that I deserve hell. But Jesus died for me. And if I would just ask him to forgive me, he will. See, and I've preached this so many times. Well, worship team, if y'all would get, get, get ready. We're going through. See, we haven't sinned yet. And God's not just going to wink at me and say, forget about it. No, sin is going to be paid for. That sin debt will be paid. Now, then he had two options. Installment plan, and you pay, or you receive God's word. You roll it over on Jesus and say, I'll, I'll let you pay my way, Jesus. That's what I did. You know what hell is? Hey, hell is this installment plan for sin. And it's, a, it's like Sears and Roebuck. Or Montgomery Wards. I'll go back a little ways. <laughs> Remember Monkey Wards? Have you ever been in a revival and created hell hole? It just gets deeper and deeper. It's a black hole. And that credit just keeps growing and growing and growing. No matter how much you pay, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what sin is. That's why there's no end to hell because it's revolving. It's growing. You pay every year. You pay, but okay, I got to put a little more, a little more punishment, a little more agony, a little more suffering in hell. I got to pay on my account a little bit more. And every year, every year, the debt gets bigger. How long? Jesus paid it all to him. I, I, I rolled my debt on him. And listen, it was paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm free, free, free because of this great service. Have you done that? Now, if you die right now, is your debt satisfied? Is it paid in full? If not, roll it over to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I owe a debt I can't pay. Take it. Yes. 
celebrate that. That's the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life. We ought to do a little dancing down here, a little, little celebrating, blow the show on. If you pray that prayer today, roll your sin over on the young man, that's something to get happy about. So let's get happy today. So tell me if you're with me in the front, prayer partners, if you pray that prayer, why don't you come take us one by the hand and say, I pray that prayer today. I, I am free, free, free. God, yet it's been paid. Maybe you need to come pray and ask God to touch you fresh today. Maybe you have a need in your life. He's able. Just roll up on the Lord. I love that passage. Your hunger, your need, your sickness, your disease, the Lord. 